Gresham College presents The End of Slobodan Milosevic by Professor Sir Geoffrey Nice, QC, Gresham Professor of Law. Your Honours, in deciding on the guilt of Slobodan Milosevic on specific charges in this indictment, may you be assisted by a separate and single question. Did a time come when by any modern standard this man crossed the line that divides the lawful from the unlawful in circumstances when he knew full well that he had crossed that line? That question, separate from the question of guilt on individual counts in the indictments that your honours are all facing and having to deal with, that question is helpful for a couple of reasons. Private recognition of being in an unlawful state is of course important when you look at the individual mental states that have to be proved concerning particular counts in the indictment. But politicians such as this man, Slobodan Milosevic, in the course of nine years will have countless different mental states today, a desire genuinely to negotiate, tomorrow the desire to become a statesman, the day after the desire to kill enemies by any means at my disposal or his disposal. And for him, the forensically precise mental state associated with a limited or maybe a single action is kind of hard to prove. But not if he has, by any reckoning, already crossed into territory of the mind that he knows to be unlawful. Milosevic trained as a lawyer and he became a banker. The prosecution found nothing violent or criminal in his past. By the end of the 1980s, he was a man who had tasted power and he found the taste to his liking. But he faced difficult problems for which he fashioned answers that were or were to become criminal. Judgment about this man, the court may think, may have a wider, a more general value than the value just for this case. Were Milosevic to have been, to be, a deranged monster, as contemporaneous epithets describing him might have suggested, then it would be easy to regard this trial as irrelevant. Because it's irrelevant, or would be irrelevant, to the world we like to think we inhabit of rational, democratic politicians. But of course, it's sometimes those very politicians whose embarkations into Iraq or elsewhere may yet catch the popular imagination as criminal, popular imagination as criminal for whom the tragic history unleashed by this man's deeds may be a lesson, as it must be for him both a lesson and a route to sanction by this court. But that's one way I might have opened the closing address in this case of a man who died before his case was concluded. There are three conflicts. I'll take them in half an hour on the basis that 10 minutes per war must be enough. If you can't sell your case in 10 minutes, then you probably don't have one. The, the cases, the three different indictments, tended to be proved by the evidence of different kinds, and so we look at different kinds of evidence through the three conflicts. But first, just a few general points. One, evidence in cases of this kind can't be frozen at the beginning of the case. Investigation has to continue, whatever people might like to think. It's too important to stop. And as the case develops, then more witnesses become available, more documents become available. Milosevic represented himself, and he took swiftly to cross-examination, a feature of the adversarial system imposed by whatever reasoning or no reasoning on trials of these particular conflicts. But the adversarial system is entirely outside the experience of European and Balkan citizens who have the inquisitorial system of justice. But Milosevic was soon able to beat up witnesses. However, he was, I think, a terrible advocate, always taking the bad points and never the good. 
He also gave away a great deal about himself by his demeanor in court, something that wouldn't have happened had he been represented by a smooth lawyer who could have painted him in a very different light. And indeed, it would have been a very good case to defend. Milosevic very unwisely um, cross-examined every witness. This stretched the already extended timetable of the trial, and going back to that earlier point, gave us the opportunity, as the trial was also extended by his ill health, gave us the opportunity to get much more and much better evidence than we would have done had his smooth lawyer turned up on the first day and said, well, Your Honours, um, I'm not going to challenge any of the evidence of the actual crimes. I'll look forward to dealing with the evidence. It could be such a distressing experience for the witnesses. I'll look forward to dealing with the evidence that connects these crimes to my client, Slobodan Milosevic. That would have embarrassed the prosecution. But he didn't do that. After his death, the judges destroyed, as I understand it, all their notes. There is no judgment from the judges in this case. However, uh, those of you interested, you can find that they did bring a judgment at the end of the prosecution case on certain counts that it was said were insufficiently evidenced to justify the case going forward. It's called the judgment on motion of acquittal. And you go to the ICC website, you can find there an interesting judgment by the judges on the evidence, given the limitations that they were looking at it just in terms of that measure of, suffic uh, of sufficiency. Um, I've got to assume that some of you may not remember or know about the conflict, a, a quick guide. Yugoslavia, uh, as it was, the country of South Slavs created after the First World War, having two slightly different forms between then and World War II in 1941. It disintegrated Croatia, uh, becoming a sort of Nazi state for a time. Serbia, falling under direct uh, Nazi rule. And then uh, partisans and Chetniks, uh, royalist Chetniks, dividing ideological uh, loyalties, as many of you will know or uh, re remember reading about. Killings on the territory were as much between factions as they were by Nazis. And then Marshal Tito, whose ethnicity was mixed Slovenian and Croatian, uh, took over the country. Um, it became the People's and then later the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. He embedded in the state and in its people um, the principle of brotherhood and unity. It was a state, a soft communist state, uh, with some openness towards the West. And he kept all these, um, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, uh, Montenegro, and Macedonia together until his death in 1980. There were two... Uh, serious underlying problems. First of all, it was decided that Serbia was too big. Um, it would have permanent hegemony over the other republics, which would all be smaller. So in 1974, by a constitutional change, uh, these two states, Kos uh, these two areas, Kosovo and Vojvodina, were given effective autonomy to weaken the body of, of Serbia. Um, that, that, that reduced size in the practical size of Serbia was something the uh, Serbs, or nationalist Serbs certainly, never accepted. Second, m many uh, Serbs lived in both Croatia and in Bosnia. There's, and the red bit marks it out. Um, so that's the Serbs living in Croatia, and here are some Serbs there, there, and there living in Bosnia. And if any of those states had separated, um, well, then Serbs would have to live under the control of non-Serbs. And that was not something which they were entirely happy. And so the plan of the first two conflicts in Croatia and uh, Bosnia was essentially to carve out some of these red areas, put them under Serbian control, and ultimately attach them in some continuous form or contiguous form to Serbia proper. It should be said, but very briefly, that there is a concept of something called Greater Serbia that permeates different aspects of the history of this part of the world and also indeed of the trial. It's a varied concept.
but you will find that it, it features later on in what I have to say and in any broader reading that you may make. But one way or another, the concept of Greater Serbia gave some Serbs, nationalist Serbs certainly, the belief that they were entitled to have a larger kingdom, the kingdom in which all Serbs lived. After the Dayton Accords settled the conflict that had happened in Croatia first and then, or not first, but earlier, and then in, in Bosnia, um, the, the, the problem with Kosovo remained. Remember that uh, Kosovo had been um, given this autonomy, but that Milosevic, by the time of these conflicts, had achieved his greatest coup, which was to bring Kosovo back in, to do away with its autonomy, something that may have pleased the um, Kosovo Serbs, but certainly didn't appeal to the Kosovo Albanians. And so that problem remained to be sorted out. And it was sorted out in the conflict in which NATO landed up bombing Serbia, uh, and Milosevic's loss in that battle led to his eventual surrender by a successor government in Serbia to the Hague for trial for all three conflicts. The Croatian War. Now, I should have said yes, the concept of Greater Serbia, I forgot to show this slide, very roughly would have Croatia reduced to this little butterfly size here, and this line, in case you come to hear about it, the Karlovac, Karlovac, Virovitica line is the line said by some proponents of Greater Serbia to be the line southeast of which everything is Serb. Yes, well then, the Croatian indictment. The accused was charged in some 30 allegations, always, of course, it being said that he was involved with others, with uh, crimes of extermination, imprisonment, torture, destruction of property, and so on. In the conflict, although estimates are always um, difficult to rely on, something in the region of 14,000 Croats killed and some 4,000 Serbs, mostly paramilitary groups, it may be. Now, this part of the case, and we'll look at it through the lens, if we may, of a particular category of evidence for the most part. Um, th this particular part of the case was well supported by very high-level uh, officials um, from Serbia and from elsewhere. Some of them were what are called insiders, and some of those insiders, indeed, were people who had to have anonymity for their own safety. But the overall case in respect of Croatia was that, yes, they wanted to carve out, the Serbs in Croatia wanted to carve out uh, bits of the territory, ultimately, to become Serbian. And indeed, it was asserted as part of our case that Milan Babic in Knin, uh, and Knin can't quite see it, but that's just, Knin is down there, and this is just Croatia with, of course, Bosnia there and, and so on. A man called Milan Babic was in charge, along with another man called Martic. They started off with uh, almost civil disobedience, a log revolution, the Serbs, whereby they cut down trees and made things difficult for transport. And Milosevic helped in all that. Maybe that was his first crime, but it's hardly a crime serious enough for the millions or indeed billions of dollars that the tribunal in The Hague cost. But bear it in mind. We called many witnesses, and I'll go through them very rapidly. One of them, for example, was uh, Borislav Jovic, who was a former colleague of the uh, accused and a former sometime president of the political party. And he'd written a book, so he couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't resist being obliged to say what he'd said in his book, or at least some of the things that he said in his book. One of which was that um, the accused told him that any secession of Croatia as a republic was to be exercised in such a way that the various regions of Croatia remained within or with Serbia. And that was basically the prosecution's case in a sentence. Um, incidentally, I should have said earlier, the whole, the whole uh, drive to break the uh, Yugoslavia up into its constituent republics followed the death of um, uh, Tito, and when, of course, the, the communist bloc proper was in the process of, or looking as though it was going to disintegrate, and so nationalist pressures started to rise. Um, and, and that's how it came about that people were even considering disintegration into these republics. 
Another witness we called was the president of Croatia, a man called Stipi Mecic, no friend of uh, Milosevic. He gave a great deal of extremely valuable evidence, uh, including about the fact that, that on his territory on Croatia there were paramilitary groups and other military groups, all of which could be traced back to um, Serbia itself, who were on his territory killing people, destroying property. These are not witnesses who could simply be disbelieved, as you may judge from their status, and in any event, there was no reason why they should be telling untruths. He also explained how, uh, although he was the president or the president of the presidency formally at the time, the Serbs really uh, exercised a putsch or had a putsch in order to deny him the authority that, we, that it was his to exercise. He met the accused very often, and the accused explained to him how limited would be the number of Serbs who could stay outside Serbia, basically only those few who lived right up in the north of Slovenia and some of those in the northwest of Croatia. And again, this account of the actual words of Milosevic really constituted the prosecution's case. We then come to a particular um, uh, crime, Vukovar, which you may remember hearing about here on the uh, east of uh, Croatia, where guards, um, division soldiers, commanded from Belgrade, destroyed Vukovar. There was no reason to destroy it, apart from the fact that it was part of the general plan to take over uh, as much of Croatia as they reasonably could at the time. Maybe it was part of forming uh, that, that greater Serbia, where, of course, the line roughly where I'm showing you now was supposed to be as far as Croatia was allowed to extend in the east. Um, he explained, uh, did um, President Message, about how people who uh, committed crimes in Vukovar were rewarded um, by Serbia. He, and we heard about the number of people who were expelled uh, from the town that was surrounded by tanks. It was a terrible, completely unjustified attack. Um, you can see some pictures of it. And then this woman, Dr. Vesna Bozanats, was the director of the hospital. The hospital was a place not fortified. It was not a military target. Many people went to stay there. It was bombed from the air. Um, one bomb landed and went right through the roof and came between the legs of a patient and happily didn't explode. But it was a terrible event. And Vesna Bozanats, had, Bosnats had the courage to inform the West and to complain to Serbia about what was happening. And she gave an account of how people left the hospital. And indeed, people left the hospital. They went to a place called Ovchera, and from there, there was the greatest massacre since World War II and until Srebrenica on Europe of some 200 people in one go buried in a mass grave. We also, there are some prisoners being counted, I'm not sure, it looks a bit like the Ovchera warehouse, but I'm not sure. Dubrovnik then, as you may also remember, there it is, came under attack for no good reason. There was absolutely no reason to attack it. That's how it looks when it's good. That's how it looked when the attack had been completed or partially completed. The town was never taken. But I must now abbreviate, and you can find in the notes, more detail of the evidence from senior people, including um, the, the general who defended uh, Dubrovnik, the mayor of Dubrovnik, uh, Petar Kriste, a minister, um, and also Hervoy Sharanich, who uh, was the chef de cabinet of Croatia's president Tudjman and who met the accused Milosevic on many occasions. And he was able to give um, extremely valuable information from the extensive conversations he had with him about uh, what Milosevic's intent was, but critically, that Milosevic made it quite clear, for example, as to the forthcoming conflict, Bosnia, that there was going to be annexation, and that as to Kosovo, the yet further forthcoming conflict, that there was no way they were ever going to be allowed to get their autonomy back. Two more witnesses, and then I'll move to the next conflict. There was one witness, a real insider, C-48, so we don't have a picture of him, we don't have a name of him, and he was a waiter. He was a waiter in a casino. Curiously, he, but understandably, 
he was trusted with being present at meetings of very senior party officials in the area in which he worked. And Milosevic visited one day. And Milosevic was told in his presence by one of these very senior officials that the ethnic cleansing in Croatia was going well. And Milosevic expressed his approval. Evidence so good that it was almost too good. Not because it was unreliable, but because if it wasn't corroborated, I doubted whether the judges would trust reliance on it. Because if they did, and then something was found out to his um, detriment later on, a foundation of, their case, of the case that the judges might have found would have been destroyed. But his evidence, immensely valuable, and in, almost in that one sentence, revealed the criminality of Milosevic. Another witness, um, an insider, C36, had access to the centers of power. And he was able to tell the court a great deal um, about what was going on uh, and about how Milosevic exercised control, both through this man, Milan Babic, and in various other ways. His evidence was so good and so clearly well informed that the journalists eventually, or quite soon, knew who it was. And it was Milan Babic himself. The leader of the Serbs in that part of Croatia who'd been working to cut their area off from Croatia and join up with Serbia. He carried on giving evidence because he had to give up his pseudonym. There was no point in keeping it. And he gave evidence publicly. And he gave evidence about the extent to which Milosevic controlled the army, about how there were parallel structures of military formations working in um, Croatia, all answering to Milosevic. So that category of th those witnesses, without all the other witnesses of proving crimes and so on, really proved the case without any doubt. And there was indeed no challenge at the end of the prosecution's case by the friends of the court to the sufficiency of the evidence in the Croatia part. But there's a postscript about Milan Babic. He was charged with offences. He was given 13 years, not a lenient sentence in the circumstances of uh, that particular tribunal. The prosecution called him back to give evidence in another case. Now, of course, he was cross-examined publicly, again cross-examined as a traitor to Serbia. He was due to give evidence on a third case, but he didn't make it because he committed suicide. Do you find that troubling? Here was a man who had done everything that modern transitional justice requires. He confessed, he was genuinely contrite, he cooperated, he'd done what he could to set out a narrative that people could rely upon. But he died. And if you have time or the interest, go to the ICTY website, it's easy to navigate, and look up the video recordings of the limited number of people who pleaded guilty and whose confessions, not confessions, whose pleas of guilt, live, as it were, to the camera, you can see. And you'll be able to see Babbage's and some others. The best bit of evidence in the case, discovered for what it was by the tribunal's uh, best possible uh, analyst and expert was this, the Cooler Camp video. This provides a bridge between Croatia and Bosnia. And it goes back to the question I asked when I gave you the first couple of minutes of what might have been an opening or the beginning of a closing argument. Milosevic was a careful man, but he made mistakes. One of his mistakes was to go to the ceremony in 1997 of an organization known informally as the Red Berets, but also known as JSO, a paramilitary organization. And at the celebration, you can see him vaguely there, and I'm sorry, the pictures aren't of the highest quality. There he is again, there he is shaking hands with someone. There he is being shown around the room, and he's being shown a map. 
The whole thing was also audio recorded. And in the course of this visit, it was made plain that he was being thanked for having established a paramilitary group, effectively, funded by Serbia, in May of 1991. And that paramilitary group operated and committed crimes, as was revealed in this video, both in Croatia and in Bosnia, although that's not the last you will be hearing today of the activities of this favoured group of Milosevic. The evidence was the evidence that we might invite the, the court to say shows the point at which he unequivocally became a criminal. You cannot set up a paramilitary group to work in other people's countries or territories, fund them and know what they're doing, because amongst other things, he said to one of the chaps, oh yes, I've read your reports when he was introduced to him. You can't do that without knowing that you are outside the law. And that happened quite early, May of 1991. As the trial judges in their, as it were, half-time judgment narrated, because it was a piece of evidence upon which they relied, included in the tape recording was one of the leaders addressing Milosevic and saying to him, Mr. President, everything we have done so far, this is 1997, so it's after Srebrenica, but before Kosovo, everything that we have done so far we did with your knowledge and with your consent. It's a piece of evidence that was devastating for Milosevic, so devastating that he had to raise ridiculous arguments in cross-examination, suggesting that when the officers said specifically you created it as in 1991, they didn't mean it, that it was in some form boasting. I don't know what it, his cross-examination was. It made no sense because he knew that he was caught by this piece of evidence as by no other. Bosnia. Well, Bosnia is perhaps the heart of all the allegations against Milosevic because included in this part of the indictments or this indictment, genocide was charged along with persecution, extermination and various other uh, crimes. All, of course, as in all these indictments, saying that he committed them with other people through whose agency he actually had the acts done, as it were. Death estimates between 90 and 104,000 and in Srebrenica alone, and in that single July 1995 massacre, 8,000. As with Croatia, witnesses uh, dealing with Bosnia included senior government, military and police officials, but there was no Milan Babic. There was no man right at the top who could say, as Babic did for Croatia, this is what I was told to do, this is where the lines of authority were. This part of the case was particularly dependent on, or at least benefited from, documentary evidence. And although, of course, we're looking at uh, the crimes from the perspective of what happened in Serbia and in Belgrade, because that's where Milosevic was. After all, Milosevic was never at war in these first two wars. Serbia was never at war. It was helping people in other states, in Croatia and in Bosnia. Um, so, so we were looking at things from the point of view of what was happening in Belgrade and in Serbia. But nevertheless, there were a couple of documents um, formed elsewhere that were of importance because in Bosnia, you had the Bosnian Serbs. You remember the red bits in Bosnia that would ultimately perhaps be joined on to Serbia proper? That's the areas of Serbia with which we are concerned. And the various autonomous regions that were going to be pulled out of Serbia, uh, out of Bosnia, had the man Radovan Karadzic um, as a leader. And in May 1992, at a session of the Bosnian Serb Assembly, he um, set out, or somebody set out, and he spoke to six strategic objectives. Now, these were the Bosnian Serbs' objectives to which our case was Milosevic would be lending support. Just look at the first, fifth, and sixth. The first 
established state borders separating the Serbian people from the other two ethnic communities. Five, divide the city of Sarajevo into Serbian and Muslim parts and establish effective state authorities in both parts. And then six, ensure access to the sea for Republika Srpska. Republika Srpska is the part of Bosnia that is, or is to be Serbian. Those, the first and fifth objectives could not be met other than by violence. And yet it was to these objectives that the Bosnian Serbs uh, associated themselves and it was to this general program that Milosevic gave support that we were to say was and was manifestly criminal. Incidentally, the other document that emerged from the same general area was a document that dealt with the different approach that might be taken to carving out areas depending on whether a village or a town was a, Muslim, a Serbian majority already in Croatia or not. And in fact, the difference is between the two different approaches were rather slender. There was a determination to create as much of Bosnia as Serbia as could be. Now, amongst the evidence that was called uh, and relied upon were intercepts. They were, they were taken by Bosnia Herzegovina Official State Security Unit. Uh, they covered not, I think, to May 92, it might be to February 92, but 91, 92, and they were available to the prosecution. Now, these uh, documents, which had conversations between Milosevic and Karadzic and various other people, were immensely valuable in what they showed um, about Milosevic's consent about the plan to keep all Serbs from other territories in one state and how that was an evolutionary process that would require ethnic separation. Given the shortness of time, let me take you to just a couple of uh, intercepts that give a flavour for the sort of things that the judges would have been able to read about in full. One, the Serbs, this is Milosevic speaking, will not be divided into several states. This is addressing Karadzic. That should be the premise of your thinking. The single, maybe enlarged, maybe almost greater Serbia, Serbian state. On another occasion, please let's move. Don't give in to anybody anymore. This is speaking uh, of uh, Izabegovic and the Bosnian Muslims in Bosnia. And if they want to fight, we'll fight. They should go to hell. Whoever wants to fight us, we'll fight and we are stronger. Who wants to join Alia, that's as, as, as a Begovic, to beat us? He may. He will lose. So these intercepts told us a great deal and were the precise words of the defendant setting out his state of mind, his intention, and what was going to happen. The next set of documents were, uh, not the next set, another set were the second best or the first best, best bit of evidence in the case. They're the documents of the Supreme Defence Council. This was a council of three people, including Milosevic. Um, they were stenographically and indeed audio recorded. We know precisely what he said, his exact words. And it covers a nine-year period with meetings about once a month. Um, in the course of those uh, records, before we look at the ones that are actually on the screen at the moment, the records reveal how Serbia supported the Serbs in Bosnia and in Croatia, but they did so effectively secretly or in secret. They reveal how Milosevic and his colleagues were indeed aware of the use of paramilitary forces uh, on these to other territories and also aware of the need to uh, deny knowledge of their doing what they were doing. Um, they revealed that there was a very clear plan to take territory from the other, uh, other republics and to join it to Serbia. And they revealed that Milosevic, unlike his Bosnian Serb colleagues, was at least realistic to this extent. Uh, they might have wanted all of Bosnia. He said, no, you can only ever get half, and even that is, in a sense, more than you're entitled to by population distribution. Of course, these documents uh, extremely valuable as they are. Um, and perhaps we just look at these two examples now. Um, there's one here where he was dealing with Kozirev and the contact group, which was a negotiating group. And they got, already by the time this was said, 
physical, as it were, possession. They've got majorities in large parts of Bosnia, and he makes it clear that they've been offered the territory to expand by one-fourth the size of Serbia and to legalize it. And indeed, of course, in due course, that was to be what happened, because the Dayton Accords have effectively given to the Republic of Serbska legal status, and uh, yet that was territory obtained, some would say, by genocide. And, uh, and then on another occasion, on the 25th of August, 1995, uh, after Srebrenica, Milosevic says his precise words, if the Muslims refuse the peace solution, they will be told they are to be left alone with the sword of Damocles hanging over them in the form of uh, Ratko Mladic, General Mladic. Now, the records, of course, are interesting for what they show. But to the careful lawyer or the careful observer, you also look for what is missing. And what is missing is, first of all, Although these were provided by Serbia, what is missing is a lot of records, particularly around the time of Srebrenica. And what else is missing? Well, nobody complains in these meetings about what happened at Srebrenica. At one of these meetings where Mladic turns up, apart from everybody being enjoined to treat the meeting as confidential, a meeting very shortly after Srebrenica, when people knew what had happened. Is there a word of remonstration with Mladic about what had done? Not at all. Milosevic was to go off and negotiate at uh, Dayton for everyone, all for, for all Serbs, without ever criticizing publicly or privately Mladic for that dreadful massacre. It is now being laid at his door because he is, of course, on trial in The Hague for it. I also, I think, showed on my first lecture, but for entirely different reasons, one of these uh, records um, which showed that Milosevic had conversations with Mladic at the time of um, Srebrenica itself. Thus, for documentary uh, exhibits, we also called another really important witness, a man called Dr. Tonsvan who was a professor, a cautious, conservative professor at uh, University of Amsterdam's Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies. And he spoke not a word about Yugoslavia, at least not to me. He spoke about other conflicts and other massacres. And he explained how ideology plays a part in processes leading to the commission of genocide involving various types of radical nationalism which dehumanized targeted groups. He showed how such actions use collective historical memory in an attempt to create ins and outs, them and us. He explained how nationalist ideologies are later used to legitimize, rationalize and justify the genocidal process and how although individual motives for participating in the acts may be varied, Ideologies give an overall sense of direction to what should be done and impart a sense of purpose to individual perpetrators. And yes, I am reading, and it comes from the judge's judgment when they had to deal with some of the allegations in Bosnia at the end of the prosecution case. He explained that genocide is generally a crime of state and that the central political leadership are decisive in the commission of genocidal crimes. And then critically, he said, and explained Cr crimes like genocide, crimes of mass violence with which you're dealing here uh, in Bosnia are never bottom-up crimes. They're not crimes that start with the perpetrator. They are top-down, even if you can't see the marionette strings. The evidence was immensely powerful. People came up to me afterwards and said it was the best evidence in the case because it didn't mention Yugoslavia, but you could see from the learning what it was. You could read across to the facts of Yugoslavia and thus go through the, to the process of inferring that, of course, there was leadership and there was control and direction for these terrible things that were happening that were characterized as genocide. Finally, uh, for, uh, and because we've been dealing with an academic approach, 
maps are immeasurably valuable if dealt with by um, knowledgeable demographers. So that very rapidly, and to show you how you can have evidence of something without really having a live witness, apart from the demographer, who of course you've got to trust. The red bits, this is Bosnia, the red bits are majority, or Serb majority areas before the conflicts. The brown bits, there, 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 are areas where there was no majority, a, a mixture of ethnicities. And this is in 1991, um, following a census. These happen to be the particular, we couldn't charge Milosevic with every single area of Bosnia. These are the ones that we selected to charge him with, including the brown areas like that. And that is the ethnic majority map, the actual population from uh, reliable sources in 1997. Had there been ethnic cleansing? Had there been enforced changing of population? Of course there had. You've now got a continuous Serb-dominated area that you can join on if you're allowed to Serbia proper. So that by evidence that doesn't rely on the accuracy of observation of a particular witness, the case was really proved. Kosovo. Um, uh, come back to all that later. Uh, just to say, one should never overlook that there are, these are what the, these cases are about. This is a man who was recruited, this man here, a couple of days before, uh, killing people. And there's a mass grave. And then this, after Srebrenica, is another paramilitary group which took six very young chaps and killed them a few weeks after Srebrenica. And the important part of that evidence was that um, the, the, the paramilitary group concerned, the Scorpions, was controlled from Belgrade. <laughs> it was a Serbian force. Never mind. That's what happens. The Dayton agreements, and you get applauded by all those people. Um, and there you see the map again with the red bit that it would be possible to join on to. Serbia, Kosovo. Well now, Kosovo indictment, five, five charges, deaths probably in the order of um, about eight to 12,000. Um, and all these conflicts had actually started in Kosovo before um, the, the Croatian conflict. Uh, the, the, the Kosovo Serbs, after Tito's death, the Kosovo Serbs were uh, unhappy and they wanted a champion. Milosevic was not their first choice a man called Ivan Stambelic. Milosevic's mentor, mentor was their first choice, but he let them down, so they took Milosevic. And that was the first step on his way to taking over um, power in the party and in politics in Belgrade. Um, and indeed he became effectively the leader of all Serbs for the duration of these conflicts, although they were in different territories. But so far as the Kosovo Albanians were concerned, um, the Kosovo Serbs had been unhappy in the 1980s, and so had the Kosovo Albanians, some of whom, or many of whom, uh, wanted freedom from the yoke of uh, Serbia proper, and didn't like at all that their autonomy had been taken away from them by Milosevic in his most successful act favoring Serbs before any of these conflicts started. After Dayton, he might have buried his history and become a statesman. He would never have been tried, maybe. But of course, he had to respond to the Serbs who originally supported him. And that meant he couldn't let the Kosovo Albanians get away with anything. And so there had to be a crackdown. The crackdown led to the conflict and then to the NATO bombing and eventually to Milosevic's Surrender. There was a great deal of evidence, an immense amount of evidence about Kosovo. In the time, I'll just take you to a couple of slightly interesting bits of evidence. Our very own Lord Paddy Ashdown. He went uh, to Albania from, sorry, he went to, to uh, Kosovo, but he went from Albania on a slightly secret mission, really looking over the garden fence from a position where he was not to be uh, expected. It wasn't expected that he'd be there. 
And he saw, uh, and this is from his evidence, uh, this is in 1998, he says there were collections of armored personnel carriers and tanks gathered waiting to conduct further attacks, two, attack, two tanks going away from me. And they were systematically and in turn firing at one house in the village after another from the roadside. And he goes on to say he couldn't actually swear that there was no outgoing fire from the houses, but he certainly saw none. This was, in the same way as other items of evidence had been devastating for Milosevic, this was devastating for him because it showed um, Serbian troops in Kosovo simply attacking Kosovo Albanians for no good reason, apart from the fact that they wanted to ethnically cleanse them and move them out. Um, it's a piece of evidence he was so upset about that he went to great efforts to try and prove. It didn't, wasn't helped by the fact that we had two maps which had Ashdown's vantage point shown in two entirely different positions. But he went to try and prove that Ashdown could never have seen what he claims uh, and recorded at the time that he did see. Um, Ashdown went back in September 1998 on another visit, saw other atrocities committed in Kosovo by uh, armed forces of Serbia, reported the matter to uh, Milosevic, and Milosevic denied that it could have had anything to do with him. There's this interesting exchange um, where Milosevic said to him at one stage, do you know anything about the NATO aggression carried out against Yugoslavia? And he replied, Mr. Milosevic, it's worth pointing out that the estimates are that in this period, long before NATO aggression, more than 300,000 Albanians had been driven from their homes by the action of your troops. And I warned you that if you took steps and went on, if you took no, those steps and went on doing this, you would end up in the court. And here you are. I think actually Ashdown quite enjoyed giving that line. <laughs> he certainly gave it, gave it twice. Um, but uh, one other piece of evidence, and then I shall try and draw things to a conclusion to give you five minutes of questions. There was um, a woman called Jackie Rowland, who was a journalist, and she went to a prison called Dubrava, a huge prison, which had housed a lot of senior Kosovo Liberation Army activists. She went there on two occasions, uh, 21st and 24th of May of 1999. The first occasion they saw a number of bodies uh, around the prison, it being said that um, these were the results of NATO bombing. The journalists were a bit suspicious about that because it didn't look like bombing injuries that had caused these people, but nevertheless. And then they came back at least on the second visit a few days later. The guards were in different uniforms. The bodies had been moved to here. Now, people sometimes ask me, why didn't you, in this case, abandon three indictments, three wars, nine years and four years of trial, and just try Milosevic for a single offence? Well, basically, two reasons. One, we probably needed to try him for the whole history, and if we were going to set that sort of record out, and B, we didn't necessarily have individual offences which we could pin on him. Although we didn't know it at the time, Dubrava prison might just have been such a case. Because documents subsequently coming into our possession showed that what happened at Dubrava was that, it, we, where the Serbs were trying to say, well, this is really NATO bombing that's causing all this misery, what actually happened was that the prison guards were stood down and they objected to it. And they were replaced by oh, the JSO, the same group that was the Red Berets. They came in and there was a massacre of the prisons. They were put up in the football field and machine gunned from towers. They were grenaded or hand grenaded in the sewers to which they escaped and then they were buried. And we discovered from later documentation that there was a paper trail for this decision that went back to an assistant minister who we were never able to get in contact with in Belgrade. Was this the decision of an assistant minister or even a minister? We, we might have thought not. And if we'd had the evidence and been able to show that this was indeed a top Belgrade decision, so much the worse indeed for Milosevic. 
I said this was the last piece of evidence. There's one more, and it's an absolutely uh, riveting piece of evidence. It takes us back to the value of documentation and the foolhardiness of some people in conflict. Uh, in April 1999, this refrigerator truck with dead bodies in it was found in the Danube somewhere in Serbia. Information about it was suppressed at the time, but there was subsequently an investigation. The bodies in the truck had been killed in Kosovo, buried, unearthed, and put on the truck, being sent north to be reburied in Serbia at a piece of ground very close to a military installation. Why do that? Well, the reason was revealed by this man, General Obrad Stavanovic, if documentary reason was required. He, a, a Serb general, police general, made a note in his diary. And the note reads, President, no corpse, no crime. Backbreaking work. They will use evidence on crimes to justify aggression, clearing up, simultaneous clearing up of territories. No corpse, no crime. Explain precisely why bodies were being moved from Kosovo, where they had been killed, to be reburied and hidden in a country that it might be thought international observers would never reach. But they did. When asked, who's the president? Stavanovic procrastinated, but only for a bit, because he accepted that the office where this minute was made and the president to whom he was referring in his own diary was indeed Milosevic. How might I have concluded a closing argument in this case? Take your swivel chairs again, press your white jabbers, and let me address you for just a couple of minutes, Your Honours. There were, in this case, two questions to consider at any given time. What did Milosevic's men do? What was done by the men, the forces that he supported from Serbia? And the second question, what was his state of mind at the material time? And it may be well to consider how clever this man was. From an educated background of which he could be proud, he showed cleverness to you, the judges in court. Hearing a couple of languages in the questioning and answer without interpretation and correcting the English version transcript as it came up, you thanked him for it. Did you notice that he only ever corrected when it was in his favour? And the same cleverness must have suppressed an equal number of errors that he detected. And does that tiny example tell you just something, however slight, about this man? The man who, when young, looked as though uh, in his respectable business clothes, never in casual clothes, looked as though he might uh, do well in business or as the banker that he'd become, perhaps he would have become a mid-level government official or a mid-level party official. But a man who was offered power by the, Kosovo, by the Kosovo Serbs and he turned that boom to his perceived advantage and became the leader of all the Serbs. Yet he was a man without clear political philosophy apart from the philosophy of maintaining his own power, something that was dependent on keeping his power base of Serbs loyal to him, and they had much stronger agendas to meet. The same cleverness of this man 
has to be borne in mind when the court contemplates his years in office, receiving accurate information from embassies around the world of what was happening, from non-governmental organizations, setting out records of human rights abuses, from face-to-face -face encounters with senior international figures of all kinds, telling him what was going on. A clever politician in his position receiving information has these days to be clever enough to know of the cause and effect that operates in a violent world. Politician says or does this and the citizen he leads or speaks for will do that. And the that that the citizen may do may be extremely criminal. Milosevic could not suggest that what Dr. Tonsvan told us about the etiology of mass violence is a mystery. It is not a mystery. It's commonplace. And all modern politicians, if they are to do their job, have to know what their actions may bring. And avoid front lines as he might, he never went to them. Avoid the suffering Serbs when they were kicked out of Croatia in 1995 by Tudjman and sent on their way to Kosovo. He never saw them either. Avoid all those peoples as he might. He knew what he had done and what he was continuing to do. His avowed intent may have been to keep Serbs in one state, not itself criminal. But the, for the start of the offences alleged in the criminal indictment, and without doubt from the day he established the Red Berets or the JSO, who featured in Croatia, Bosnia, in Kosovo, and once more, he knew that what he was doing was indeed criminal. It was criminal from that moment until the last Kosovo Albanian was killed or expelled. Did Milosevic start as a bad man? Or was he coarsened and corrupted by the temptations and difficulties he faced? Let's have a look at him. The one time, by the way, in the entire trial when he smiled. It was, I think, making a joke about me. But here's another happy picture. This is Milosevic on the right, happily in the arms of Ivan Stambolic his best friend, his mentor, his in Serbian kum, best man. The man who promoted him. The man who was unwise enough in 2000 to stand against Milosevic politically. And so Milosevic had him shot and laid to rest in a shallow grave because he had become, if he wasn't to begin with, a common criminal. A common criminal acting through others in the same way as for all those three indictments, he had acted through others, knowingly committing crimes in conflict. There is, there is only so much that a white shirt and tie of respectability can hide. Not enough, the prosecution would argue, to shield this man from the judgment of your court. For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.